down, just take it for me. On the last push, literally. Sam, 10, 14, 11, 20. Okay, guys, we're done. Good morning, Bethel. Are you happy to be here this morning? Okay, let's try that one more time and let's get a little bit more enthusiastic. Are you happy to be here this morning? I am. Let's stand. We're going to worship. Are we enjoying the second season that we have in Ohio? Winter and then summer. You know, it's, I love it hot. So, you know, let's, uh, let's just enjoy the Lord this morning. Let's just corporately join the adoration and worship that he deserves. We're going to introduce a couple songs we've been playing on Wednesday nights, so if you come on Wednesday nights, great. And some favorites. Do it only you can do With one word the mountains move When you breathe the dead rise And the bones come back to life there is power in this room. Let's repeat that first. Do what only you can do. With one word, the mountains move. When you breathe, the dead rise, and the bones come back to life. There is power in this room. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's life. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Like a river running wild, like a never-ending fire. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, it's your name that tears down walls. me will fall so we will stand and we will fight that every wrong will be made right there's power in this room where the spirit of the Lord is there's life where the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom like a river running wild like a never ending fire where the spirit of the Lord is. There's life where the spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom like a river running wild. Like a never ending fire where the spirit of the Lord is. Come move throughout our city. Let your spirits fill our streets We're shouting to the nations Your love has set us free Come move throughout our cities Let your spirits fill our streets We're shouting to the nations Your love has set us free Where the Spirit of the Lord is There's life Where the Spirit of the Lord is Like a river running wild, like a never ending fire, where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's life, where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's freedom, like a river running wild, like a never ending fire, where the Spirit of the Lord is. Lord God, we thank you for that spirit 
that resides in the hearts of those who have called upon the name of Jesus Christ and have accepted you, Lord Father God, for what you've done through your son, salvation, something that we can't obtain on our own. Father God, we pray that that spirit would move here this morning and that, Lord, you would be glorified through the words that we sing, through the, the thoughts that we have, through the moving that you do in our hearts, Lord, to reveal those things, that, uh, Lord, we would just give you credit for all you are. We thank you, Lord God, who you are, and that's why we praise you, for who you are. Thank you, Lord. You are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from. You are my refuge, my whole life long. Where else would I go? Surely my God is strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love
Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of
the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Cause nothing compared to the promise I
goodness of your hands, the Lord. We thank you for what we see in your creation of people. Lord, the goodness of your creation in that. And Lord, you desire for all to hear about this good news that we've been singing about. The joy that we have, the decision that we made to stand upon that truth, that the joy of the Lord will be our strength. Lord, I thank you that that resides in me, and I thank you that that's available for all who call upon the name of Jesus Christ. You're a wonderful God. You're an amazing God. You're a great God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, God plowed throughout the universe's way, then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou Father God, may you be high on that throne in our own hearts and in our lives. 
Lord, I sense your presence here this morning, and I know that you're going to do great things. You're already doing great things in many of the hearts. Lord, allow our hearts to be available to, to sense you, to hear you. And Lord, may we be obedient to follow you and what you instruct us. I thank you for my family this morning. May you be blessed. We say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. You know, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm going to do exactly what Pastor Phil does. We're not done worshiping yet, which we're not. Um, uh, Kenny and Jen, there she is. They're both right there. Look at that. They're going to share a song for a, a special, and we're going to make it available to take our offering, our giving this morning. Uh, as they're playing, you can feel free to get up and put it in the box back there. There are just a couple announcements that I'll make right now. Uh, so that we can have a, a nice seamless uh, service here. Uh, uh, Wayne Taylor is going to come give the message this morning, so as soon as they're done. Um, I really do sense God's presence here this morning. Uh, the last song, I just, it was my dad's favorite, so it's hard to not cry. So thank you, Lord. I didn't cry. It's actually my favorite, too. We have a great God, don't we? Amen. He has done great things, right? And he's going to do more great things? Amen. Amen. You know, and as I said Wednesday night, we need to praise God and we need to worship God, not because of, wow, you've done great things for me. He has. But he's God. We praise him because he's God. And we need to recognize that truth. I do want him to continue to work in my life and to do great things. But he's God. He deserves it. A couple of the announcements, there is no Beacock Kids this morning. Uh, they will resume next Sunday. Um, the Golf League will meet tomorrow. Uh, I'm not sure who's in charge of that. Okay, well, yeah, there you go. Dan is, he's by default. Um, they will be meeting tomorrow and uh, as scheduled. And uh, do not forget that every day there is going to be a five minutes with Phil at 9 a.m. online. Um, how many have enjoyed any of that? A few. Good. Very good. He is going to continue that. Now, as for this Wednesday, we will not be having service here, um, but there will be an online service that Phil uh, will be uh, facilitated. I'm sorry, that uh, it will be facilitated through here, okay, by Phil. Uh, he's going to send it out through his uh, computer. So please enjoy that. Um, and uh, I guess those are all the announcements. So let's go ahead and we'll pray over the offering. And they'll play and we can drop it off back there, okay? Heavenly Father, we just thank you that uh, we have seen your miraculous hand, your wonderful hand, during this time, Lord, of uh, just oddity in our lives that you have blessed this fellowship, you have blessed this family. Uh, Lord, we, continue, uh, we ask that you would continue in that way, Lord, Father God, financially, spiritually, Father God, uh, in our health, in our finances, in our relations. And Father, I especially pray as we sang with that first song, the relations that we would have with the world. Lord, may you work in our city. May your spirit move. And Lord, may you work through us in the lives that we interact with, that the light of Jesus Christ would just provide a great appetite for those to seek more of that joy that we, we uh, speak of, the joy that we live in. Thank you now. Bless us offering, and uh, we just ask you to bless this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come Longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus and King of endless worth no one could express how much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor All I have is yours Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Everybody have a good 4th of July? Yes. Yeah? Okay, good. You know, yesterday I was a little shocked. I listened to some interviews that some people did. And interesting enough, it was on a college campus. And they asked them the question, what year was the Constitution signed? <laughs> they, they interviewed at least 10 people, maybe 15, not one person knew the date. So then they asked them, okay, what country did we get our freedom from? Not one of them knew the answer to that question. Not one. So then they went a little deeper and they said, okay, 
Who get, can you give me one or two members that signed the Constitution? Again, they couldn't give an answer. So, you know, that concerns me about our country. Because I feel like if you're on a college campus, these are people that are probably going to be leaders of some sort. They've spent the money and the time to get an education so they can be out there in the forefront. And they don't know some of the basic history about our country. It's scary. It's scary, folks. Because, you know, the old saying is, is if you don't know the history, you're liable to repeat it. You're very liable to repeat the history all over again and again and again. And so we need to learn from those things. We, our country was founded and we're growing and going. And are we perfect? No way. But I think we're the best thing going. What I read about other countries and what I see goes on there, we think we got problems. We don't have near the problems that they do. So, you know, it, it's important that we know about our country and that we learn to celebrate the freedoms that we have. And I, I agree, we got a lot of changes that we have got to make. Uh, I think this whole pandemic has brought up changes that we need to make. And, you know, some people don't believe it's true. I do. My doctor tells me, hey, you've got to wear a mask and stuff when you're out in public because your system is compromised because of the meds you're on. So you have to wear a mask or you could be in deep trouble real fast. So I, I'm convinced everybody I talk to, friends that I know have had this thing. One was in the hospital for three months on a ventilator. He finally pulled out of it, thank God. And now he's moving forward. Another couple that we know was in their house for several weeks because they had tested positive. So I, I think it's real. I think there are people that are using it for their own benefit. But I think we need to be careful. And we need to be cautious. And we need to listen to the wisdom of those that seem to know what they're talking about. Now, obviously, there's a lot of scare tactics going on to use this for their own benefit. But, all right, now, let me get off all that stuff. <laughs> we want to talk about the joy of the Lord this morning. That's what we want to talk about. I think we're at a time that we need the joy of the Lord in our life. Now, I, I want to make a distinction here because sometimes people confuse two things that are similar, but they're not the same. And that's happiness and joy. Happiness is when everything you want's going your way. When you make every green light when you're on your way to earth, boy, that makes me happy. That makes me excited. It's like, wow, this doesn't happen very often, but this is going, this is going to be a good day. It's crazy how some little thing like that can make your day. But that's happiness, you know? Or, you know, I don't know, we could name all kinds of things. When you go to the restaurant and they get your order right and they get it there on time, and wow, I'm happy about that. But you know what? Joy goes deeper than that. Joy is something that's there even when you hit every red light, even when they get your order messed up, even when they forgot your order and you had to sit there and wait while they made the order. That happened to me recently. <laughs> I, I got to tell this. So, so we go in this pizza shop and we order a pizza. And we say, okay. And they say, what's your last name? Okay, we'll get to you in a minute. It'll be ready. Just a few minutes. So we sat there for about a half hour, 45 minutes, and no pizza. It's like, what? So I go up, I say, what? oh, man, our system messed, our system messed up. <laughs> and we didn't start fixing your pizza until just a couple of minutes ago. I wasn't a happy camper, I want to tell you. I wasn't happy. But I thought, you know what, I need to bite my tongue and let him work this out. And I felt really bad because the guy got in a big hurry to get that pizza out of there and he burned his hand really bad. And I was like, oh my goodness. 
yeah, how am I going to rail on them now after this guy's got his hand wrapped up and he's there and, and I'm worried about getting my pizza on time and now he's worried about how he's going to work all day with a hand that's burned. It's like, sometimes we've got to get it into perspective. But the joy of the Lord, it's something that comes from him. It doesn't come from situations. We need to see that. As a believer, we need to know that we can experience the joy of the Lord no matter what. Now, you know, the book of Philippians was written by Paul. Do you know where he was at when he was writing this? He was in prison. Now, we think our government's something else. <laughs> Sometimes I get pretty frustrated at our government and our leaders and all the nonsense but then when you look at the Roman Empire, you say, well, you know what? <laughs> we are in pretty good shape, even with the mess that we're in. So here's Paul. The Roman government has put him in jail for preaching the gospel. He's there. And this is the guy that's going to write the words that we're going to read this morning about the joy of the Lord. Now, you know what? If I was sitting in prison... I'm not thinking about the joy of the Lord, probably. It's going to be, I'm going to have to, and, and yet, when you read about Paul, he was in jail, him and Paul and Silas, and they were singing praises to the Lord. Wow. That's the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us, folks. He wants us, in spite of our circumstances, to enjoy the joy that comes from him. Now, you know, if you read the first part of this chapter, we're going to start reading in verse number four in a minute. But if you read the first part of this chapter, uh, he was writing to them at Philippi, and there was two ladies in the church that had some kind of problem. He doesn't go into what the problem is, but they had a problem. And Paul said, you know what? They need to get this worked out. They need to get this solved. There needs to be unity in the church. Now, you know, we can sit here and act like we never have a problem, but that's a, well, it is what it is. Somebody didn't shake our hand and now we're offended. Somebody didn't greet us the way we thought they should. They didn't respect us the way we thought they should. And now we're complaining all the way home and it goes on and on and on. I don't know what was going on with these ladies. But Paul says, you need to get this worked out. If you're going to have the joy of the Lord, if you're going to have unity in the church, you've got to work out those differences. You know, God sends people into our life. This is what I have found anyway. He sends people into my life, and some of them are hard to love. It's like, God, why, why do I have to interact with them? And I make it all about them. They need to get their act together. Or they need to, you know, straighten out. They need to do things the way I think they should be done. And God's saying, yeah, but what about you? Maybe you need to learn something. And I'm like, okay, God, I, I, I'll try. But I, I don't really like this. I'd rather have people that agree with me and, you know, go along and everything's wonderful. But he's like, no, that's not going to happen. Get ready, because it's not going to happen, Wayne. You're going to have people that rub you the wrong way. They say exactly what you don't think they should say. They do exactly what you think they shouldn't do. And you're going to have to learn to live with it. Yeah, well, I'll just go to another church. He said, no, 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 no. Because if you go there, I'm going to send another one just like them. So you better learn to deal with this. You better grow. Because if you don't grow, you're going to miss out on the joy that could be yours because you refuse to deal with what I put in your life. Boy, that's, sometimes that's tough. But we need that. We need to move forward. Now, you know, the, the first three verses, he's talking about unity. And then in verse 4, he, he talks about, you need to rejoice in the Lord. Now, he's just said, okay, the church has got a problem. They've got these two ladies that are quarreling over something. But you know what? You need to rejoice in the Lord. You need to rejoice in the Lord. 
so what we want to look at today is how do we experience that joy? How is that accomplished? Because he spells it out here for us. He tells us you need to have the joy of the Lord. What I think is really neat in Scripture, it not only says this is what you ought to do, and sometimes in Christianity what I find is that's what happens. People tell you what you ought to be doing, and then you're like, but I don't know how to do that. But the Scripture tells us, here's how you do this. This is what you ought to do. And I look at it and say, but God, I can't, I can't do that. Yep, he says, I know that. So here's how that's going to happen. So let's, let's start reading in verse number 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Why don't you stand as we read that? And I think they got it up on the screen. I hope they got it up on the screen. All right. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Lord, we're thankful for your word. I pray now as we look at it this morning, Help us to learn what you would have us do from your word. Help us to see it clearly. Help me to say things in such a way that the point gets made and that we can all grow from it. We can all move forward. And we'll be careful to thank you for we're asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, so he starts off. He says, the very first thing, if you want the joy of the Lord, let your moderation be known and he says to all people not just to some not just to your favorites not just to the ones that you like not just to the ones who do it the way you want to do it not just to the ones who agree with you he says let it be known to all and what he's saying is is learn how to be gentle and compassionate with everyone now that doesn't mean you don't have an opinion that means you're gentle and compassionate you know I have family members that are diametrically opposed to me on political issues but I can't have a conversation with them because you know what happens they explode they're angry they won't listen to my, they're not gentle about it. I try to say, well, let's have a conversation. We can just, no, it's not going to happen. We have to learn how, and, and it's very easy, you know, when they start in, then it's easy for me to jump in and say, well, you think you're so smart? Here, let me outdo you. I can say more than you. And then it's like, wait a minute, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you going to let down your standard? of being gentle and compassionate to other people? Are you going to not understand where they're coming from? You know, any crowd, when you're talking about politics, any crowd, if this crowd is a typical crowd, half of you in here, or 45% of you, are diametrically opposed to the opposite party. And there's another 45% that are on the other side of that. So it's like, okay, we can really cause division if we start going down the line here and saying what we think. But you know what? If we're gentle and compassionate, one of the things that I have discovered over the years, when the compassion kicks in and I listen to somebody's point of view, that doesn't mean I agree with them, but sometimes I understand why they feel the way they do. Because of what they've been through in their life. Because of their experience, it has taught them this is the way to think about this. 
Now, you know, they're not going to sway me. I have my opinion. I'm pretty hard-headed. If you don't believe it, ask my wife. She'll tell you. I always tell her she has the right to her opinion no matter how wrong she is. <laughs> Sometimes I even listen to it. But we need to be gentle and compassionate with other people. You don't know where they've been, what they've been through. You, you really don't know. Sometimes you think, I think I do. It's always interesting in the counseling office when people come in and they, they sit down and I start asking them questions and I'm like blown away. When that door closes, boom, it all comes out. And it's like, oh my goodness, no wonder they're having the problems they're having. No wonder they're going through. No wonder they think the way they do. They need somebody that can be gentle and compassionate with them and hear what they have to say and try to help them explore where they're at. And maybe they can make a difference. Now, maybe you say, well, you know what? And I've had people say this to me. Well, I'm not a gentle, compassionate kind of person. Oh, really? Then God's got some work he's going to do on you. He didn't say, okay, if you're a gentle, compassionate person, then you show that to other people and everybody else is off the hook. No, 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 no. That's not what the scripture is saying. It's saying that if you're a believer, then you need to allow the Holy Spirit to make you a gentle, compassionate person. It's not all about you. It's not all about me. We need to see that. And he says this is possible because the little phrase in there, the Lord is near. Now what's he saying? There's two things he's saying here. First of all, he's saying the Lord's in your heart. Do you think the Lord's not gentle and compassionate? Do you believe that? If he's in your heart, if he's really in your heart and you allow him to work on your life from inside, because that's where he wants to start at, folks. He doesn't just want us to act like we're gentle and compassionate. He wants us to be gentle and compassionate because he's in our heart. How many people do you know that before they were a believer, they were a holy terror? Everybody hated to be around them. And now they have become more gentle, and more compassionate. There's one song that says, even the dog knew it when I got saved. <laughs> he didn't get kicked near as often anyway. So we, we need to see that the Lord is there. And, and you know, everywhere we go, every day of the week, no matter what we're doing, no matter who we're interacting with, the Lord is in our life. He's right there. Now, all we got to do is recognize his presence. Do you recognize his presence when you're in that situation, when they forget to cook your pizza? Do you let the Holy Spirit speak through you and say, you need to be gentle and compassionate. These people are having a hard time. And they were overwhelmed. And it was like, oh, my goodness. And then when he got burned, I was like, oh, man. How am I going to get angry now? We need to let the Holy Spirit speak to us and show us and work through us so we can be gentle and compassionate. There's another thing with this, too. Do you realize, and most of you know this, but I'm going to remind you, do you know the Lord could come back before we even get out of here? He could come back before this service is over, and, you know, do you want the last thing that you did before the Lord comes back to be something mean and vindictive and is not compassionate. It's like, wow. You know, we need to live expecting the Lord is coming. And it could be any time. We have no guarantees. We don't know when that's going to be. Jesus says, I don't even know. The Father is the only one that knows. He's going to send me back to get my church. And when he says it's time, I'm coming back. And I'm going to rapture them out of there. And we're going to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to be there for seven years. And while we're up there enjoying the marriage supper of the Lamb, do you know what's going on down here? <laughs> you don't want to be here, I'll tell you that. 
it's going to all break loose. You, do you realize that Christians are the only thing holding this world back from exploding into total chaos? You remove the church out of here, and it's going to be total chaos. People are going to do whatever they feel like doing. They're going to take whatever they want. They're going to bully people around. You have to be big and strong and bully if you're going to make it. But we're going to be with the Lord. See, we don't have to worry about all that. We just have to worry about being ready when he comes. Now, you know, when my parents became Christians, I'm telling my age here now, they, they uh, were really into the holiness movement, and part of the holiness movement uh, basically seemed like to me as an 11-year-old was that everything that's fun is sin. <laughs> that's the way it seemed to me. Oh, no, you can't go to the movies. Why? Because that's sinful. What? Well, we watched that same movie on TV. What? The big screen makes it evil? What? what? What's going on here? I didn't get it, but... Anyway, and, and you know how they uh, <laughs> kept us from going to things that were sinful? They said, what if you're in there and the Lord comes back? You think he's going to come in there and get you? It's like, hmm. And it worked. Because <laughs> I was like, yeah, boy, if I did go to a movie, I sat there sweating bullets thinking, oh, boy, I hope this is over before the Lord comes back. <laughs> I hope this is over. I want out of here. I don't want to miss the rapture. Because he's not coming in here after me. But thankfully, they finally got some balance and they realized it's not movies, per, all movies. You need to use your head. If it's something that's not appropriate for you to be at as a Christian, then don't go there. Whether it's a movie or anything else, whatever it is, the point being, we need to live expecting the Lord to come back. I've told this story before. I, I've got to tell this again. A friend of ours, when his mother became a believer, she started going to church, and his father didn't go to church yet. So when they started teaching about the rapture of the church, she didn't quite grasp all that. It wasn't clear to her. So she went home and told her husband, now listen, from now on, we're going to sleep with the window unlocked. And we're going to sleep, uh, we want our bed where I can get out the window if I need to, if the Lord comes back. <laughs> but you know what? The thing was, she was expecting the Lord to come back. She was living, expect she was a little misinformed, but she was living expecting it. And my challenge to you, if you want the joy of the Lord in your life, if you really want to have joy, then live expecting the Lord to come back. So, he says, be gentle and compassionate to people because the Lord is near. And then he goes on to say, uh, let prayer replace being anxious. Wow. How many times have I got all anxious about everything and then my wife or somebody say, well, have you prayed about that? Oh, no, yeah, I didn't. Why don't you pray about it? Why don't you seek the Lord? Why don't you, and, and we should have regular times of prayer that we spend with the Lord every day. You need to find a place to pray. You need to find a place to get along with Him. Now, let me, let me say this, because I've dealt with a lot of people over the 30 years that I've been at Emerge. A lot of people. And I, I remember... This happened a couple of times, not exactly the same, but the one really sticks out. This guy pastored a church of like two or 3,000, and he was coming because he was so anxious and depressed that he could hardly get out of bed in the morning. And so I said to him, well, I, sir, I, I, I'm a little confused here. You're a pastor, right? Yeah, and you're pastoring a very successful, large church and yet you're so anxious. Do you spend time in prayer? Oh, yes, he said. Yes, yes, I spend time in prayer every day. Really? How is it that you're so anxious and depressed if you're spending, and he told me he spent like three hours a day in prayer. So then I was curious. I was like, well, what kind of prayers are you praying? Because when I get along with the Lord... 
I come out of there lifted up and excited. So I said, okay, so tell me about your prayer life. He said, well, I have my church to put out a list of all the members of the church, you know, a couple thousand people on this list and all the family members and everything. And they put out a list of all the uh, people in Congress and all the local uh, dignitaries and so on and so forth. So he's got this list of thousands of people. And he says, I pray through that every day. Okay, well, that, there's nothing wrong with praying through that. But then I just simply ask him a question. Where does God get to speak? You know, if pr prayer is a conversation, where does God get to speak? And, you know, that's where I find I get in trouble. I go in and I do all the talking, and God's patiently waiting. Okay, are you done yet, Wayne? Are you done? Not quite. I got a little more to say, God. Hang on. So I, I learned a lesson over the years that, first of all, we need to start out with worship. God is always worthy of our worship. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what's happening in your life. God is God, and he's worthy to be worshipped and praised. And we need to start our prayer life out by worshiping and praise him. Because when we worship and praise him, he shows up. And he speaks into our life. And that's what we need. You know, if we just did that, that would be good enough. Probably, we could probably say, okay, I'm good. Let's go home. But we need to go beyond that. The second thing that should be a part of our pray, of our pray should be thanksgiving. Do you thank God for the things in your life? Everyone in here has got things to thank. The fact that you're sitting here, you should be thanking God. You should thank God every day for what he's done and for what he's going to do. You need to thank him. Now, you know, does he know we're thankful? Probably, I don't know. But you know what? I'm a father. And I kind of like it when my kids every once in a while say, thanks, Dad, for whatever it is. It makes me feel really... And I'm sure that God is like, oh, wow. Do you remember when the, the 12 lepers or the 10 lepers were healed? And they left and only one of them came back. Now, leprosy is a disease that destroys people's lives. They had to go through their life if they had leprosy, crying out to anybody they would meet, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean, don't get near me, you could get leprosy. Here are 10 of them that get healed and only one of them comes back to say thank you. And he says, where are the rest? What's going on? I think sometimes God's looking around. He's hearing all these Christians. And they're going through their prayers. And I think he's probably thinking, well, did they miss what I did for them? Did they miss that I saved their soul? Did they miss that I sent Christ? Did they miss that I healed them? Did they miss that I provided for them? Did they miss? We need to let that be a part. Do, do you see how that praising God and being thankful to him, how it changes us? It doesn't change God, it changes us. We're different after that. And then he says, well, you, you, can do, you should make your petitions. The scripture tells us if you have a need, come to the Lord. Now, one of the things that I find with people, they really don't know the difference between needs and wants. I, God, I want, I've got to have that new car. Really? You got, a, you got a pretty nice car you're driving around in now. Why do you need that new car? Well, because, yeah. I think you get the point. He says, if you really have a need, and, and I have to be honest, there have only been a few times in my life where I've had to say, God, I really have a need, and if you don't meet it, I don't know what's going to happen because I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to provide for my family. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And it needs to be done. So he's saying, if you have a need... Don't hesitate. Bring it before the Lord. He wants us to. 
But the exciting thing is, is he not only stops there, but he says, if you have a request, that's okay. You know, if you request God, God, I'd like to have whatever. He's okay with that. And sometimes he actually gives it to us. Many times he gives it to us. So it's okay, but petitions and requests should not be the main part of our prayer. If petitions and requests are the main part of our prayer, then we're going to come out of there down and out. Because you know what? The way we're made, if we just go in there, if prayer is just a place to rehearse all my woes and to rehearse all the things that are bad in my life, boy, that's a downer. You come out of there worse than when you went in. So don't let that happen. Satan tempts us. Yeah, he said he's going to supply you. You should... Wait a minute. I need to have a relationship with him first through praise and worship and thanksgiving. And a lot of times, by the time I'm through praising God and thanking him, it's like, you know what, God? I don't, I don't really have anything today. You seem to be taking care of it all already. Amen. Now, I'm not saying every time it's that way, but there's a lot of days it's that way. And I come out of there uplifted and, and with the joy of the Lord in my heart. And that's what we want. Okay, let's move on. The third thing that he says here is I'm going to give you some filters for your thoughts and use these to filter out the way you think. Now, I hope that all of you know that you, know, you think at about 4,000 words a minute. Okay? Most of the time you say that to people and it doesn't mean anything to them. But... I'll give you something to compare it to. The fastest speaker speaks at about 200 words a minute. Now think about that just for a second. So if I'm telling you, you are wonderful, you are the best thing since sliced bread, I've never met anybody like you. But you're telling yourself, I'm a worthless piece of trash, I'm no good, I don't know anything, and you're all down on yourself, guess how many times that's going through your head? At 4,000 words a minute, you're repeating that over and over and over. And so what's your self-image look like? It doesn't look like you're wonderful, you're the best thing since sliced bread. It looks like I'm a piece of trash. And so Paul's saying, listen, if you want the joy of the Lord, you've got to get those tapes off of your brain. You've got to get them removed. Get the, quit saying that stuff to yourself. Quit going down, 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 because that's what happens. People are spiraling, spiraling, spiraling. So he says, here's the filter. The first thing, is it true? Boy, I couldn't, that, that takes care of about 90% of stuff. Right there. Because what people are thinking is, you know, they hate me. How do you know they hate you? I don't know. I just know they hate me. I know my boss hates me. So the boss says, I'm going to see you in the morning. And I, I remember this happening to a person. I want to see you in the morning before work. Can you come, here, come in just a few minutes early? This guy couldn't sleep all night. Because he thought the boss hated him. He was telling himself that the boss hated him. When he got in there, the boss said, listen, you've been doing a really good job. I want to give you a raise and a promotion. Because he went in with all his defenses up. I, when he says this, I'm going to say that. When he says that, I'm going to say this. Because what he was thinking wasn't even true. So, I, I, and I've had, I don't know how many people over the years that they come in and they'll tell me something and I'll say, well, how do you know that's true? And many, many times, they can't answer that. They don't know why they think that's true. They just believe that it's true. And if we believe it, then to us it's real. So Paul's saying, if you want the joy of the Lord, quit believing everything. Find out if it's true. Is it really true? Is it reliable? Is it valid? Is it honest? Find out. 
It doesn't hurt to do a little exploring. And sometimes when I explore it with them, I remember one time a lady came in and said, well, we've got to decide in this session today what school my daughter's going to. Really? Why have we got to decide that? Because school is starting tomorrow at this school and that school. But Okay, so you're going to make, you know, flip a coin and decide which school your daughter's going to. You need to go to those schools and find out information. Yeah, but... Yeah, but she'll just be a few days late getting started, but you'll get her in the right school. It's not true that we have to decide today. So there's a lot of things that we tell ourselves, this is the fact, this is the truth, this is the way it is. And Paul's saying, if you want the joy of the Lord, you've got to really examine to make sure if you think it's true that it really is true. The next thing, is it noble? Is it worthy of respect? A lot of times people are thinking about things Why are you wasting your time? Why are you wasting your time thinking about this? So what? Let it go. Yeah, but... It's like, okay. It's not even worth respecting the time that it takes to think about it. He says, get it out of your head. He said, is it just? In other words, is is it right according to God? Because sometimes we think we know what justice is, and we're trying to say, well, this is the just thing to do. And God's saying, no, it's not. So we need to figure that out. Is it really just before God? Otherwise, we're going to be, we're going to have this, you know, some people say it's easier to get revenge. E, is that justice? No, but it feels good. Yeah, well... Maybe as a believer, you need to settle down on that and figure out what's the just thing to do. What's the right thing to do? Just yesterday, I heard a testimony. You remember the African-American church in South Carolina where the guy went in and shot nine people? And this person was telling the story of how those nine families I can't help but cry thinking about this. Decided that the just thing to do was to forgive him. I couldn't have done it. I'm telling you. Or I would have had a hard time. It would have been me and God. We would have had to have that one out. This wacko comes in here and shoots up the church. What? And you want me to forgive him? Ooh. But they decided that was the right thing. And so they did it. You see, folks, sometimes we face things that aren't near as difficult as that. And we want to get revenge. And he's saying, no, wait a minute. What's just before me? What's pure? He says, if there's impure thoughts. And you know... (laughs) This is where people get into trouble. They have these impure thoughts. And we usually think of sexual sin, and that's one place of impure thoughts. But there's other things that are impure about getting revenge, about anger, and all that. And, and you know, the interesting thing is, is that when you look in the Old Testament, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And people say, well, Jesus did away with the Old Testament. No, he didn't. He took it to a whole other level. He said, if you look on a woman of lust after, you've committed adultery already in your heart. Is he saying one of those is equal to the other? No, he's not. What he's saying is, if you deal with this while it's a thought, you'll never commit that act. The Old Testament says, thou shalt not commit murder. Jesus said, you need to love your enemies. Ooh, Jesus, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What he's saying is, take care of what's going on up here. So that it changes the way that you think. Because if you change the way you think, you're going to behave differently. The next thing that Paul says is whatever is lovely. Think about that. Whatever brings real love. Those are the things you should be spending your time, invest your time on thinking. How can I show this person that I love them? That's what Jesus is saying when he's saying, love your enemies. And it heaps coals of fire on their head. Because they don't know how to take that. 
They don't know how to take it when you show them love. And he's saying, you, you need to plot how you're going to show love. It needs to be something that you're thinking about. Good, whatever's of good report. Whatever rings true to the highest standards. He says those are the things. So he's saying these six things you need to filter your thinking. And then he says, you know, you need to practice what we've taught you. Because right actions follow right thinking. Wow. Sometimes... Well, I want to do what I'm supposed to do, but... And he's saying, no, get your thinking straightened out. Because if you think right, then your actions are going to follow it. And he goes on to say, God is with us when we act on what we know is right. If you know it's right, and you do it, guess what? God is right there with you. He wants to be with us. He wants to bring us joy. All right, so here's the question. The follow the, we're going to conclude with this. Do you want joy? Do you want the joy of the Lord? Is that what you want in your life? If it is, then let your moderation be known to men. Be gentle and compassionate to them. Let prayer replace anxiety spend time with the lord let him speak into your life give him the opportunity to do that filter your thoughts <laughs> i've heard people say well you're gonna have to be careful because my filter is off right now <laughs> yeah okay i i can pick that up pretty quick turn the filter back on let the holy spirit filter your thoughts because if you're filtering your thoughts, you're going to behave completely different. God blesses us when we follow his word. He wants to bless you and I. So I challenge you this morning. And I know Pastor Phil usually concludes the service. If Ralph will come on up, I'm going to let him do some music. And if you want to get along with the Lord for a few minutes, then do that. Stay around until God's through with you. Pastor always says that. And it's true. We need to stay around and let the Holy Spirit talk to us. And not only here, through the rest of the week. We need to slow down and let the Holy Spirit speak into our life. And whenever you're, you feel like you heard from the Lord... Maybe you've already heard from the Lord and that's fine. Then you're dismissed and you can leave. But Ralph's going to play some music and those who want to stay and allow the Holy Spirit. Let me pray and then, Lord, we're thankful for your word and for what it says to us. I pray that each one of us will allow your joy to permeate our life so that others around us will see our good works and know that we have the joy of the Lord. And as a result of that, I know they're going to want a relationship with you. They're going to want that same thing in their life. Now go with us as we leave here today, and I just pray a blessing on each one that's listening to this service online or wherever, and each one that's here. And we'll thank you for we're asking all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Lord bless you. Who sent us greater wisdom?